Good morning, friends. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as with many of you, I'm sure this is our first in-person uh, uh, meeting of any kind, and uh, and I think uh, we're all tired of the the Zoom uh, calls, and we really want to see other people and you know meet and have dinners and things of that nature. So thanks to uh, to Hubert and Andre for inviting me, to Valerie and Marianne and all the other organizers for putting together such a great course, and uh, of course to all of you for making the trip out. Uh, this is really one of my favorite places to come out for a meeting. So uh, it's, as you can see, it's beautiful. Uh, there used to be two lovely dogs here. There's only one left now, but he's very friendly. And, uh, and you know, I, I have to say that uh, this is a special place for me because uh, in the past, many important collaborations and big grant proposals got started at just dinner tables just outside. So we've, we've, uh, I'm, I'm looking back to see what started at meetings here, and it's quite a few things that started. Uh, you know, one big IMI project, for instance, started just a conversation just outside. So uh, I hope it works out that way for you as well, that you get to make new friends and, and start collaborations and friendships that will last a very long time. So um, I'm going to talk about AMR in the context of COVID. COVID, of course, is not something which uh, you know I really want to cover, but uh, uh, it's really to do with, let me see if I can get this moving. OK. So uh, COVID, of course, you know, has affected every country at some point or the other in, in the last two years. And that goes without saying. And many of us have been drawn into working on, on COVID itself. Um, but looking back at pandemics, uh, the 1918 flu pandemic, which was prior to the availability of antibiotics, was a significant event because of the significant mortality that was caused by secondary bacterial infections, specifically Staphylococcus aureus. Now, MRSA was not really in the picture at that point because there was no M, there was no methicillin to begin with. But if you look at the proportion of uh, you know, people with positive cultures, patients with pneumonia with positive cultures, with subsequent uh, you know, fatal pneumonias, these were significant. And it, it, you know, at least for the, for the second wave, it's, you know, the, the, the secondary bacterial infections were, were important uh, for determining uh, uh, you know, whether someone lived or died. And in fact, if you looked at uh, influenza-related pneumonia deaths and pneumococcal pneumonia deaths, uh, you know, the, the time from illness to death was very, very similar. So these almost sat on top of each other. And at that point, it was not recognized that bacterial infections were quite so important. Uh, it's really by looking at tissue cultures going back to 1918 that people have been able to figure out that this was an important cause of death. Now, fast forward now to today. I'm going to walk through a set of slides which are really around uh, antibiotic consumption all of my talk is obviously focused on the human sector, even though this is a One Health course, because this is really in the context of COVID, which is primarily a human health issue. Um, and there's, there's interesting evidence from different parts of the world, from community, nursing home, and hospital settings on first an antimicrobial prescribing, and then, of course, on secondary bacterial infection. So for, let's first start with, uh, with, with the evidence on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on prescribing. So these are data from, the, from, uh, from Scotland. This is probably the first national study that was done. And you can see that the, the dark line is 2020, 2019 is the dashed line. So for respiratory tract infections, in fact, uh, there was an increase in prescribing you know, from the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So let me see if I can, what is this? Is it a point I can use? Uh, maybe not. Uh, but you could see that at the top that there's a bump up, but then subsequently it sort of comes down. For non-respiratory infections, there wasn't really a... Uh, is, no, no, the, the slide movement is... But is there, a, is there a laser pointer? Oh, it's the laser pointer. Yeah, you have to press it the wrong time and then show the results. Uh, Ah, okay, I see. This is a very, it's a very fancy laser pointer. <laughs> this is not really laser at all. In fact, this is this is like some uh, relative positioning pointer. So uh, yes, so you can see there was an increase for the respiratory infections and then a decrease. But for the non-respiratory infections, there was essentially no change at all. 
Oops. No, my other one got lost. Okay, let me see. I can only do the pointer or something else. Ah, here we go. So uh, these are data from the United States, which look uh, at uh, this is you know the early part of the epidemic in in twenty uh, in twenty twenty, uh, and you're looking at the percentage change relative to a baseline of 2017 to 2019, and then looking at what's happening in 2020. And this is by prescriptions in retail pharmacy. So again, community prescribing. And you see a significant decline in community prescribing uh, relative to the baseline of the previous three years. Now, this is attributed to a number of things. One is that people were simply not getting sick with symptoms that would indicate, uh, you know, that, that, might, uh, that they might go out and get an antibiotic prescription for. Uh, it's possibly uh, attributed to difficulties in accessing primary care itself, uh, without which it's hard to get a prescription, at least in the U.S. And, uh, but this is a very U.S.-specific kind of an experience. And you can see this more specifically in terms of number of patients with antibiotic prescribing in millions, and you see definitely a sharp decline in the first part of 2020 compared to the, uh, compared to the baseline. And as you can tell, uh, antibiotic prescribing is highly seasonal. You have high levels of prescribing during the winter months because it's correlated with, uh, with the influenza season and goes down in the middle of the year. Uh, but the decrease seems to have been even sharper uh, in, 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 in both of these. So with azithromycin and with all prescribing, so it seems to have gone down. Uh, and this is, again, the same thing, which is observed versus expected number of patients who prescribe antibiotics from retail pharmacies. And uh, this is the May observed. That's the May expected. So you can see that in May, there was quite a sharp decline uh, in antibiotic prescribing. Now, this is, uh, these are data from, uh, uh, um, uh, this is, again, from, from the United States, which looks at, uh, at, at prescribing uh, in, in uh, nursing home settings. And you can see that, uh, you know, this is for a lot of drugs. It's hydrochloroquine, there's dexamethasone, and azithromycin. And you can see that the changes in antibiotic prescribing were not that significant. The, the dexamethasone obviously went up after the, the, the trial that showed that uh, it was useful in critically ill patients. But overall, antibiotic prescribing doesn't seem to have really changed a lot. And ceftriaxone use actually uh, was about, you know, the, the azithromycin and ceftriaxone use was higher. But overall, prescribing was, was you know, uh, excluding azithromycin was actually 12% lower. So you didn't really see a big change, at least in the United States. Uh, these are actually data from, from India. And this is a CAF stands for child appropriate, you know, uh, 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 a a antibiotics. And, and basically, you could see that uh, for all antibiotics, you could, you could see, obviously, the seasonal trend that's, that's, that you would expect. You know, India has a has a bimodal sort of a flu season. Uh, but some antibiotics, specifically doxycycline and ferropenem, did seem to go up with COVID cases. Even azithromycin did go up with COVID cases. So the experience in India was actually quite different than in the United States, where in the US, you didn't see much of a change with COVID on prescribing. In fact, prescribing went down. But in India, prescribing seemed to go up with COVID and come down when COVID went down. You know, possibly because a lot of people were not getting tested. So if they got COVID symptoms, then they, the first thing that they could do is go out and get an antibiotic. So uh, there's not a consistent experience in community settings across the world, very different in, in developed versus developing countries. Now, hydrochloroquine, obviously, you know, you all know the story, not an antibiotic, but went up very early because of the mistaken impression that it was helpful for COVID. And then, of course, you know, went down quite sharply. Now, COVID-19 likely contributed about 216 million excess doses of total antibiotics and about 38 million excess doses of azithromycin between June and September 2020. Uh, that's after the lockdown and until the epidemic peak. So the lockdown was from uh, March till March 25th till about June. And then there was, after that, there was a, you know, there was an intermediate period and then the, the peak was really in September. And you can see that uh, in India, it was, it was uh, quite associated with, with COVID. Um, and these are data which come from, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, which are prescribing in inpatient settings and hospital settings. And you can look at the baseline 2015, 2017, 2018, 2019, 
and uh, this is the you know the the antibiotics that were prescribed in 2020 and you don't really see a significant difference across the different years uh, maybe a reduced use of penicillins uh, you know greater use of uh, uh, so you know other uh, antibacterials aminoglycosides tetracyclines and so forth uh, and but overall these are not very significantly different uh, fluoroquinolone seem to have gone down uh, you know, at least from the previous year, but not very different from the previous from the years before. So, if you look at inpatient settings, not really clear that prescribing changed a huge amount. Now, moving on to co-infection. So, prescribing. I think I guess the bottom line is that there's mixed evidence from around the world, really depending on on where you really look. Now, if you look at incidence of co-infections, uh, again, not as bad as one would have really expected. So, of in this particular uh, you know uh, retrospective cohort study. Of a total of 989 consecutive uh, patients with COVID-19, about 7% had other bacteriologically confirmed infections, and about 51 hospital-acquired bacterial superinfections uh, in about you know 43 patients, about 5%. Now this is not very different from what one would expect in a you know non-COVID period. So it it we didn't see the the huge increase that one might have really expected. Now this is a very nice study which looked at a comparison across different countries uh, describing secondary back, uh, infections in COVID-19 patients. As you can see, the vast majority of these studies really come from China, uh, some from the US, but, but really from China. And you did see secondary infections in some proportion of patients, uh, but you know, by and large, except for you know, at least one of the outlier studies, uh, they were not very different in terms of, of uh, secondary infections than one would expect during during normal times, maybe slightly higher, but not, not a huge difference. And the resistance profile of clinical isolates causing secondary infections in COVID-19 uh, has also not been that different. Uh, and this was based on an Indian study. So this was just based on India. And uh, it, you know, these look like very high numbers, but these are pretty standard par for the course for India. So it wasn't like this changed a huge amount. Now, there was one study which looked at secondary infections in hospitalized COVID-19 patients in India itself. Uh, and uh, the breakdown of pathogens was mostly Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, and, and Pseudomonas. So this is, again, pretty uh, standard, and then with E. coli as well. And so about 3.6% of patients de develop secondary bacterial or fungal infections, and the mortality was about 56%. Uh, now, so the only takeaway from this study was that the numbers of secondary bacterial infections weren't necessarily large, but when people did have the secondary bacterial infections, their mortality rate was significantly higher than when they did not have the secondary bacterial infection. So uh, again, not as many studies of this kind as one would like to see from around the world, but I, I think the main takeaway was that hospital infection control did seem to have kept up to be able to keep out the secondary bacterial infections, but if you were unfortunate to get one of those infections, then you did much, much worse. I mean, a 57% uh, mortality rate was just not something you would expect during other times. Now, of course, it also you know, relates to the fact that you know, there might have been something observationally I mean, uh, uh, difficult to distinguish between those who had the secondary bacterial infections versus not. Maybe they had weaker immune systems. Maybe they were worse off. Maybe they had worse COVID infections and so forth. So the bottom line is that the evidence on antimicrobial prescribing is mixed. It's decreased in community settings in high-income countries, uh, increased in those settings in India at least, uh, and increased in hospital settings in some countries. I shouldn't say many countries, but we don't really have full evidence here yet. There's limited evidence. I didn't talk about this, but this, you know, we, we looked at this extensively. There's actually not a lot of studies looking at infection control compliance. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that there was infection control compliance, but not a lot of you know, systematic evidence showing that it actually increased. Um, and the secondary bacterial infections reflected the underlying levels of infection control. Again, no significant difference here. So uh, not as much change as one would really expect and not a clear picture. So moving on, what could we really think of it in a One Health manner? So vaccines. So vaccines, why do I bring this up? Because if you think of a few things that changed during COVID, one was that, you know, mask wearing, that people's hand hygiene, even in community settings, did go up. We know that. Um, the second is that acceptance of adult vaccination in the context of COVID did go up. I bet most of us have never really had an adult vaccine, right? I mean, few folks sort of had a seasonal influenza vaccine, mostly if they lived in a, in a high-income country, but seasonal influenza vaccination is not a thing around most of the world. 
So for most adults around the world, uh, a COVID vaccine was probably the first vaccine that they have received since they were since they were adults. Uh, all their previous vaccines would have been in the first you know, two years of life. And uh, that's helpful because vaccines can be effective. This is a old study from the US which showed that the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which was introduced in uh, 2000, was uh, probably the single most important driver of reductions in antibiotic prescribing in the United States. Prior to the introduction of this vaccine, children under the age of five were the biggest uh, uh, consumers of antibiotics largely because of this vaccine and the reductions in the number of ear infections and so forth, uh, children stop being that category. And that category is now the, you know, the seniors, uh, people above the age of 65. And the routes by which vaccination reduces the incidence of AMR are twofold. One is there's fewer infections, which means you have lower disease burden and therefore you save lives. But the other fact is that fewer infections also means less antibiotic use and reduced selection pressure. And remember, this doesn't apply only to vaccinations for bacterial pathogens. Vaccinations against viral pathogens also has the same effect, because if you reduce the amount of seasonal influenza, a lot of inappropriate prescribing related to seasonal influenza goes down, so you have less antibiotic use, reduced selection pressure, and you save lives that way as well. This, of course, is the more direct approach, uh, which is of direct uh, reduction in disease burden. And um, if you look at vaccine acceptance, uh, I know we think a lot about you know, people not really accepting vaccines and so forth. So the number above the bars represents a percentage of respondents in each country who responded positively where they said, if, if a COVID-19 vaccine is proven safe and effective and available, I will take it. And I have to say that, uh, you know, of course, we all expect people being in the public health world that we would think that everyone should say 100% we will take the vaccine. But we have to understand what a phase shift this is. Again, adults without experience of vaccination in their lives to say, yes, I will take a vaccine. And, you know, higher across many countries. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, you know, this study was done a, 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 a while back, probably done in 2020 at the end of it before the vaccine came in. But if you would ask that question, I would say that in many countries, the, the vaccination acceptance has probably gone up, not gone down. I, I certainly know that's the case for India, where initially there was more uh, of a concern and now there's less of a concern. Now, PCB7 introduction did reduce both prescriptions and ambulatory care visits in 2000. So you can see there's a very sharp decrease right there. And all of this is important because maybe we can translate this into influenza vaccines if we were able to get a universal flu vaccine. So the flu season is a key driver of antibiotic consumption. In, in fact, I shouldn't say a key driver. It's probably the key driver of antibiotic consumption. Uh, this is total consumption around the world. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you can see that the peak months of consumption in the Northern Hemisphere are the winter months there. The peak consumption in the Southern Hemisphere is July, August, which is the winter months here. And of course, there's bimodal peaks or no peaks at all around the tropics. So influenza is really, the, you know, the winter months where there's a cough or cold, you know, probably not related to a bacterial pneumonia is really what's driving uh, prescribing. In fact, uh, influenza in the United States is almost perfectly predicted by antibiotic use data. What this means is if you were to take antibiotic prescribing and you were to take fit that also to uh, to the influenza, you can predict the influenza cases by week just if you knew the number of antibiotics uh, prescribed were. Now, obviously, this is not great because these are all inappropriate antibiotics, but it just shows how important influenza is in driving antibiotic prescribing. Um, now, this is a more recent study. We, uh, we looked at the impact of influenza vaccination and antibiotic use in the US. So, uh, so in the other paper, we were just looking at the influenza cases. Here, we were directly looking at, at, uh, at uh, influenza vaccination. So even after controlling for a whole bunch of factors, access to healthcare, childcare, climate, vaccine effectiveness, all of, all of that, a 10 percentage point increase in the influenza vaccination rate was associated with a 6.5% decrease in antibiotic use, uh, which was equivalent to a 14.2 fewer antibiotic prescriptions per thousand uh, individuals. So at least in this study, uh, and there is actually a European study which is quite similar to this, uh, influenza vaccination can be in a very, very important way in which we can take care of antibiotics. Now, this is only one 
set of a uh, number of studies that Matus is sitting here, who's uh, from WHO, and we're doing with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the vaccine uh, research unit at WHO, a whole set of studies which will, you know, which have come out in different journals, but now there'll be an overarching report that comes out on this as well, which look at the effect of childhood vaccines and antibiotic use in low and middle income countries. And we've never had this kind of systematic evidence before, and this, this paper was, uh, was published last year. Uh, and what we see was that if you look at the estimates of attributable fraction for vaccine preventable infections, you can see that you have quite a significant, probably anywhere between, you know, roughly about 20 percent of the of, of both for, uh, you know, pneumococcal cases as well as rotavirus cases that you can reduce uh, antibiotic consumption by by providing the vaccination. So uh, and in fact, if you did the same thing for for tuberculosis, we modeled of a potential future vaccine, the M72, and we, we, what we were able to see was that a future TB vaccine could reduce about 10% of the rifampicin-resistant cases, 7.3% of deaths, but would also, uh, you know, would also, uh, uh, you know, obviously it's reducing the resistant infections, which is what we really care about here. So the burden of resistance uh, for some bacterial infections can be averted through a post-exposure vaccine. Uh, and this is the this is by country. Obviously, you have the biggest reduction in India, which has the largest number of rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. But you also have Nigeria, Indonesia, Russia, China, all of which have a significant uh, uh, role to play in terms of reducing the number of resistance ca resistant cases if there were a vaccine that was actually introduced. Now, uh, sorry, I should have skipped that. Okay. Now, going on to, uh, to what the picture really is now compared to where it was, every three or four years, CDEP puts out a report called the State of the World's Antibiotics Report. I'd encourage you to read it. The last one came out at the beginning of last year. And what we do is just do a snapshot of various sorts of things, resistance, consumption, state of new antibiotics, use in animals, all of the, the evidence that's published, and look at it every three, four years so that we can understand how we're doing uh, you know, with respect to antibiotics. And here what you can see is that, so this is, uh, uh, this, the left side, sorry, is, is uh, A is high income countries, and this side is the low and middle income countries. And you can see the, uh, you know, the, the va variability in per capita antibiotic use measured in defined daily doses across these sets of countries. Obviously, penicillins tend to get used uh, less, it appears, in the low and middle income countries. And, uh, and, and if you look at the, the numbers of resistant uh, bacteria, the, the, the percentage that are resistant, you see a higher uh, problem with resistant bacteria in develop, uh, developing countries compared to in the developed countries. Uh, if you look at the drug resistance index, now the drug resistance index is just, I'm sorry, that got cut off. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's basically, it's just a weighted average of resistance weighted by how frequently an antibiotic, use is, uh, antibiotic is used to deal with that particular bacterial pathogen. Uh, it was just a way in which we could communicate the problem of resistance to people who are not microbiologists, people who don't work really in public health. And all that we're doing here is giving them just like a stock market index, right? So you have uh, the NISE index or the FTSE and you, or the Dow Jones. You're just giving them a one snapshot picture to say how bad resistance is in a particular country. Again, this is a index that we put out every couple of years or so. And... Uh, and you can see that as uh, just a snapshot index, the resistance problem is the worst in India. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, these are the high income countries, these are the low and middle income countries. And it's a bigger problem in the low and middle income countries compared to the high income countries at this point in time. And countries like Canada, Norway, Finland, Denmark, all have fairly low drug resistance indices compared to the countries at the bottom out here. So every bar is the DRI for countries which report resistance to at least five or more pathogens. Now, if you look at total antibiotic consumption, this is uh, slightly dated back to 2015, and it has been, I'm sorry, I always put, I mean, this is just from the slide, I mean Francophone West Africa, I've been corrected on this more than once, but uh, that's Francophone West Africa, it has been going up. Antibiotic use in China has been relatively flat. Antibiotic use in Brazil has been going up, and then you know, in Saudi Arabia has been going up quite significantly. Uh, if you look at the change in national consumption of access and watch antibiotics, of course, you all know what these are. 
access is the ones that everyone should have access to. The watch are the ones which uh, you should really have in a formulary and not really, uh, you know, make widely available. And the reserve are the ones that should be used only for the worst emergency situations. The blue indicates a decrease uh, in the access antibiotics. And here, this is what's happening with the watch antibiotics. So you can see that use of access antibiotics is actually going down in many parts of the world while use of the watch antibiotics is actually going up in many parts of the world. Now, that's of great concern. It just means that we're using a lot of antibiotics that we really think globally we should be keeping on reserve. Uh, of course, you know, there are countries around the world, like in the U.S. or in Europe, where both access and watch are going down, which is really what you really want to see. But you definitely don't want to see an increase in, in this particular category. Um, turning to animals, so these are the most recent data and then projecting forward on total antimicrobial consumption in tons in humans, cattle, chickens, pigs, and fish. So in aquaculture, we just published these estimates last year. And uh, what you see is overall, uh, turns out that the aquaculture consumes very little antibiotics. The vast majority of antibiotics on the planet are consumed by pigs, more than even the humans. So, uh, you know, we are about the same level as the poultry and we're, you know, obviously more than the cattle. But if we were to cut back antibiotic consumption in, in, the, in, the, in the pigs, uh, and, uh, you know, this is really the opportunity for maximum uh, reductions. And most of those pigs happen to be in China. So uh, as a species in a particular country, pigs in China are the biggest consumers of antibiotics in the world. Um, now, that did go down last year because of the large number of pigs that died. Uh, so that, that went down, I think, about 70%. That shows up in the data as well. But I have no doubt that that production will come back up next year. Uh, now, we don't pay that much attention to resistance in animals. Uh, I know a lot of you are vets, so you're not concerned just about resistance in humans. You're also concerned about resistance in animals. This was a paper that we published in Science. I'm sorry, I don't have the citation. The first author is Van Bokel. Uh, and what we did was we looked at uh, a measure of resistance, which is basically proportion of drugs with more than 50% resistance going from 2000 to 2019. And what we saw was that resistance measured in animals has actually been going up quite significantly in both chickens and pigs, not so much in cattle, but chickens and pigs, it is going up. So AMR is no longer just a human health issue. It is an animal health issue. Obviously, no surprise to the veterinarians in the room, but it's, uh, it's something to bear in mind that uh, we need to conserve antibiotic effectiveness, not just to treat humans, but we also need to conserve it to treat animals. And to do that, we need to think about how we're using the antibiotics. Uh, now, we published this, this, uh, uh, a companion paper looking at policies to reduce antibiotic consumption in food animals by 2030. This is the baseline of, uh, you know, we would have about a 200 ton increase if we didn't do anything. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry, 200,000 tons if we didn't do anything. Uh, and uh, if we had regulations or a reduction in meat consumption or a user fee or a combination of all of these, the regulations would basically uh, reduce the amount of antibiotics per uh, kilogram of meat produced that the combination of all of these could have a significant impact in cutting uh, the total antibiotic consumption in animals. Uh, now, finally, coming to antibiotic development. Now, this was the picture in 2013. This is the picture in 2019. Uh, as you can see that a lot of these drugs in phase one, phase two have moved into phase three, are in applications, and some have even been approved. So I would say overall, the direction of progress for new antimicrobials is quite, it's quite positive, but it's not nearly enough. I think we have a long way to go. Now, last two slides are, again, from that same report on the state of the world's antibiotics. Um, I think we all agree that antibiotic resistance is a one health problem. And as a one health problem, we really need to be tracking multiple indicators, uh, whether it is the presence of surveillance in humans, animals, or the environment, whether there's a national action plan, what the antimicrobial resistance indicators you know, in humans and animals really looks like. Uh, what the use indicators of antimicrobial use looks like in humans and animals, uh, and then public health indicators, vaccination, under five deaths, uh, incidence of disease, and then also the health system. All of these put together construct a picture of how well a country is doing on antibiotic resistance. We've done this for about 70 countries, I believe, in that last report. We, we hope to expand it. If any of you is interested in, in, 
in helping provide the data and be you know part of this exercise going forward do let me know but and certainly look at the report it's online state of the world's antibiotics report in 2021 and see if this makes sense for you in terms of your country to see if 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 this makes sense in terms of the indicators and whether this, this is something which uh, that that you find useful in in your country uh, this is just for india uh, we've done it for you know italy we've done it for a number of other countries croatia i just threw up three random countries there but they're all very different but we've tried to put together the best information from around the world in, in one single dashboard that if you're presenting to your director of health or your director of veterinary services that you can say, listen, this is where all the other countries are and this is where we are. And these are the indicators where we really need, need to make a difference. So uh, this is for China. So uh, concluding thoughts, I think COVID-19 is an opportunity. It's increased the acceptance of, global, uh, of adult vaccines globally. We need to leverage that. Uh, the pipeline for new antibiotics is getting stronger, but very slowly. And the acceptance of One Health approaches is gaining momentum. I think you'll all agree that this term One Health was not someone that most people in your country would have even known what it was uh, before COVID. But now at least they realize that COVID came from animals and therefore we have some understanding that human and animal health are interconnected. So we need to build on that understanding and appreciation to see what we can do for AMR as well. So um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.